I'm with Portland Community College and I'm the moderator for the session. Uh, just before we get started, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask at any time. Uh, so they're uh, happy to answer the questions as they come up. So uh, to introduce the panel, I'm going to start from uh, uh, the, my, the far left, uh, Kim Scalzo, and she's the director for SUNY, for the SUNY Center for Professional Development. And uh, next to her is Brad Snyder, and he's the Associate Director for Campus Technology Services for the State University of New York at Cortland. And uh, next to Brad is Joseph Moreau, and Joseph is the Vice Chancellor of Technology for the Foothill De Anza Community College District. And uh, last but not least is Lisa Stevens. And um, Lisa is the Senior Strategist of SUNY Academic Innovative in academic innovation, academic technology, and information services for the office of the SUNY provost and the leader of today's group. So thanks very much, and go for it. Thanks, Marty. We actually asked Marty to, to dispense with the reading of the bios because we really wanted to have time to interact with all of you. And I think our conversation today is more in the vein of organization and institutional advisory groups. I think Susan's having a conversation next door about more on the personal level, so it's a nice, a nice, uh, oh yeah, go ahead, thanks. Wrong way. <laughs> there you go. This is actually an extension of conversations that we've been having at this conference for the past several years. It began when Jim Twetton and I were looking at strategies for adapting to institutional change. We think it was back in Kansas, but we're not entirely sure. Um, so it's, it's a, a special treat today to come and talk about how we've actually operationalized a lot of the principles that were discussed over the past several years. Um, so we're here to tell the story of our advisory group, the SUNY Faculty Advisory Council for Teaching and Technology. It's more or less a case study, and the details about all of this story are actually in EDUCAUSE Quarterly's collaboration issue, which was released about a year ago this time. The advisory group itself was formed over 20 years ago by faculty that recognized the value in having an integrated approach with support personnel, librarians, um, everybody that was there to support the teaching and, tech, teaching and learning with technology. So our goal today is to describe some of, some of the solutions that we've employed over time. Um, and regardless of scale, we hope to give you some takeaways that can be applied regardless of your institution size, whether you're working within a group on campus or a single campus, multi-campus, uh, to make sure that we can provide some, some tactics that are hopefully effective that foster effective collaboration. I think we all know what sometimes ineffective collaboration looks like, and we're pretty proud of our story and how we've been effective uh, in carrying some initiatives forward. And that includes how to measure tangible results over time. I uh, also want to touch briefly on the differences between influence and power because certainly that's the underlying principle in any type of advisory group. And we want to start with some underlying assumptions that anyone that's involved in an advisory group effort is somehow or the, uh, somehow or the other connected back to a strategic plan in whatever that sphere of influence is, whether it's an organization, uh, uh, strategic plan, some type of campus plan, something that everybody's pointing in the same direction toward. Uh, and I've also done a lot of research over time with grassroots interest, all of the, the people with their feet on the ground that are actually doing the work and how we can all get excited about initiatives on our campus and want to march forward with those ideas and at the same time how a top-down approach doesn't always work in moving things forward. So it's about finding the sweet spot in between and how to be effective in that sweet spot. So we're assuming that your executive leadership is on board. So briefly, power versus influence. Most of you have probably seen these two columns um, and the difference between the two. The one thing that we just wanted to call out is that so many advisory groups or any type of, of energy, any type of organization that gets started with an individual effort or a small group of individuals that have a lot of energy, that's a great way to start, but we really want to focus on how to sustain an organization over the long haul so the organization's in good enough health that as people move in and move out, in fact, we're going to talk a little bit about how we, we actually instituted some term limits at one point because we wanted to provide greater opportunity for people to come in and be of service from their campus to the broader SUNY-wide effort. 
Uh, the other thing we wanted to just touch on is that we are one of the few groups that meets with the SUNY provost. Now, just to explain organizationally, and there's a slide on this, a couple of slides down, but, but SUNY is a 64 campus system, and there is a chancellor that oversees all of those campuses, <coughs> and then a provost that oversees the academic programs of the system-wide. So we're meeting with the SUNY system provost, who also meets with all the campus provosts. I think one of the things that we discovered is that working into a position of influence is probably more useful and valuable than working from a position of power or control. Uh, I think as we've, as we've discovered um, a variety of initiatives where, where people on the campuses throughout SUNY are talking about what they might do, you know, the idea that they would first say, well, bef you know, before we go too much further with this, let's check with and see what FACT is doing. Or, or, and, and so having, having that kind of influential uh, position within the system, I think, uh, serves, the, serves the, all of our colleagues much better than having than being in a position to, to, to dictate solutions or, or mandate standards or any of those kinds of things. We don't have a vote, but they <laughs> like to listen to us. Mm -hmm. Um, Kim. Yep, so um, we wanted to just tell you a little bit about SUNY. Um, as Lisa mentioned, we have a 64 campus system, and our campuses um, break down into four different sectors. We have um, uh, community colleges, we have comprehensive universities, um, we have technology colleges, which focus in a particular area, and then we have some doctoral granting institutions, our, our, our one institution. So our, our um, system is um, comprehensive and then it represents all of those sectors. Uh, we have 468,000 students, um, so pretty large. Um, we're considered the largest comprehensive system um, in the country. Uh, and so um, a few years ago, um, our chancellor, Nancy Zimfer, came on board, and one of the first things that she did was launch um, a strategic planning process which resulted in the power of SUNY, our strategic plan. And Lisa referenced um, that any um, effort like this needs to reference back to a strategic plan, so that's our vision. That's what we're always working towards. And that process, um, just to tell you a few of those steps, started with some working groups which identified some key themes that were common across the system and were initiatives that we wanted to take on and where we could have an impact in the state of New York. Um, and then uh, there were a series of transformation um, teams that were formed. Um, and one of those was on innovative instruction. And that's where, where we have focused in terms of our efforts. Um, there's a SUNY report card which um, uh, identifies the metrics by which we're going to measure our success and annually gets reported on. So there's a way for us to be accountable to the legislature in the state of New York and for all of us involved in supporting the plan to be able to um, you know, benchmark how we're doing against the plan. And where we are currently in our strategic planning process, that was launched in 2009, we're now three years into this, is we're in this getting down to business phase, which is really about um, you know, really implementing some of those things that were initial recommendations or um, initiatives that we could take on. So, so what we are involved in with the Fact Council and some of the specific things that we're gonna talk about are part of this getting down to business phase. So it's very much, you heard the speaker this morning talk about having a plan and working the plan. This is how we're working our plan and it's been pretty effective. Um, one of the, the things that the Chancellor um, um, is fond of saying these days is that we're all about systemness and how we can leverage the power of the 64 campus system for the benefit of all of the campuses and the citizens in the state of New York. So it's actually a new word in Wikipedia. Um, we're kind of proud of that. Um, and, and one of the, the key things that we're going to talk about that is really critical to the success of our initiatives with the Fact Council is that we have an, um, um, a supportive infrastructure and a very well-defined infrastructure that allows for sustainability and for um, uh, keeping our initiatives going. We're you know, a few years into this now and we have much more work to do but, but we feel pretty confident 
about how we have organized and structured all of this. So we're going to share that with you. Now, now, is it true that the chancellor coined the phrase systemness based on her inspiration by Stephen Colbert's truthiness? Yes. I think that, yeah, okay. I think that's true. Okay. Excellent. Very good. <laughs> so we're going to describe a little bit about the nuts and bolts of this very large advisory group. Uh, on the top, you'll see that there's a grid that is full of acronyms. And without getting into all the acronyms, the important point to make is that each of the sectors are represented at the table at this advisory council level. It's a governing council that meets regularly with the SUNY provost. All of the organizations to the right of that are fairly self-explanatory in terms of representatives from the university faculty senate, uh, from representatives from the community colleges, from the computer officers association, librarians, um, the, oh, doodle, the doodle group, the doodle acronym. There are directors and officers of online learning. And, uh, and Ed Toa, I'm reading off the slide. I don't need to read off the slide. You can read it just fine. Uh, down below, that represents that each campus has a representative that is connected through a listserv. And we hope to be expanding our communication efforts as part of the strategic plan, working the plan. Each person at the campus, every campus can have up to two representatives, one from the faculty ranks, teaching faculty ranks, and a second as an instructional support person. And we meet face-to-face -face at the annual Conference on Instruction and Technology. Otherwise, it's all done electronically and increasingly with Kim's support through Illuminate and our SUNY Learning Commons that we're going to be talking about in a couple of minutes. Um, so that's pretty much the body that makes up. And by the way, if you have any questions, feel free to jump in and ask a question. You don't necessarily have to wait to the end. We got a huge uh, boost in 2010. We knew that we were well positioned to really be more effective as an advisory council when our SUNY provost spoke at the Conference on Instruction and Technology in front of 500 people and tied our advisory group back to the strategic plan and talked about the six big ideas that the chancellor had cited in her plan. And if you go to the Educause Quarterly article, the video clips are embedded in that article. So you can actually hear our chancellor describe that plan and our provost talk about uh, how he values this particular advisory group. So I guess an important part of the story is going back to that balance between the leadership and the grassroots efforts is that for a time, uh, the Advisory Council fell into some routine. Uh, we, we sponsored this annual conference. It was humming along well every year. Every, every May we go to a different campus and get together. And um, it just it didn't feel like we were doing anything particularly innovative. So when we went through a leadership change, both at the top end leadership when our chancellor came in and then when I came in as chair of the council, we said, what can we do to reinvigorate this as an advisory body? So we sat down as a very small group, kind of in a, just three or four people around a table, and we identified the themes with the, the chancellor, I'm sorry, excuse me, with the provost is what are most important to his mission? Where do we need to focus our efforts? What does he need advisement on? So once those themes were identified, we said, OK, next, how do we look at a, an annual time cycle? Because a lot of our meetings were catch as catch can. Hey, when's everybody available? Do you want to get on the phone? Do you want to meet face to face? So we said, let's do a review of all the activities that typically <coughs> fall in a calendar year and define an annual planning cycle so everybody is connected between the strategic plan and an annual planning cycle, and everything becomes very predictable. Now, you want to pay attention to this little pink box that talks about SUNY Innovation Grant Cycle, because that started out many years ago as just seed funds for workshops to continue those conversations from that annual, the annual conference to try to continue the conversations on a regional basis, uh, things that were of interest to people. Um, I, I think one of the, as we re-examined this, this uh, annual cycle, I think one of the most important things that came out of that was really a refocusing on deliverables. <clears throat> and, and we'll talk a little bit more about deliverables and the innovation grant piece, but um, uh, uh, the, the UNLV president uh, yesterday uh, talked very eloquently about uh, executive mental bandwidth. 
and, and that they've got so many things on their plate. And, and w what we care about is just you know, a small piece of that. And so it was really critical that we, we knew that we had a very, a, a very strong vote of confidence from the provost uh, and that we had his attention and that we had those opportunities uh, to, to advise him uh, but those, window, those windows of opportunity were very brief and, and small, so whatever we brought forward had to be of the highest quality and really, truly actionable uh, items that, that could move the system and, and the individual campuses forward. And then one of the things that we tried to do was uh, um, try to really leverage the excitement and the momentum and the energy that um, occurred at our annual conference, much much like what happens here at this conference, and not lose that when everybody leaves and goes back to their day jobs. Um, and so part of creating this cycle was to identify some um, actions and activities that would allow people involved in these various initiatives to um, have some um, charges and tasks and deliverables throughout the year and we would set that schedule at the conference or just following the conference and would have some um, uh, real activity and be able to move some of these things forward. And that's where the task groups come in that we're going to talk a little bit more about. Um, um, but that cycle was very important to us. We did want to mention that there's also a website. We use the website as sort of the central place where people can gather information. We're starting to build out some of those communication efforts. So if someone wants to serve as a campus rep, they can come here to learn more, get oriented to the advisory group in general. But you can take a look there when you have sure. an opportunity. So digging into the, the individual task groups that were really responsible for, for the deliverables, uh, we, we put together a number of, of uh, based on the themes and the priorities from the provost, a, a number of groups to respond to those. One of them was uh, the learning environments task group, really based in, in, in the idea that we, we, there were lots of really great ideas throughout our system. We needed to pull them all together in some comprehensive way that could benefit the system uh, more broadly. Uh, I won't say much more about that. Uh, tomorrow, or today, but uh, tomorrow we have a, an in-depth session on, on our main deliverable from that effort, which was uh, a, a, an inno innovative space uh, a design repository that we are working on. How, how did the faculty um, respond to the idea of flipped classrooms that you're talk, talking about as you engage with them and changing their, their pedagogy and curriculum around, putting lectures online and bringing more experiential uh, instruction into the classroom? Well, I, th I, think, I think there's, a, there's no shortage of people that are interested in doing this, but there is a shortage of guidance on how to do it. And, and so I, th I, think that, I think that for those, for those people that were really enthused about this, I think they were grateful to have a, a resource uh, that they could refer to that was uh, that, that understood, uh, you know, the, the intricacies of, 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 the, of a SUNY campus, of the SUNY system, and, and really get some, some, some homespun guidance on that. The second task group was the teaching and learning task group, and this was really um, looking at what was happening across the system in terms of faculty development, teaching and learning, and so this group focused on identifying what that was and what were some of the key initiatives that um, it would be beneficial for the system to take on. And um, that task group actually evolved um, into a community of practice, which is working with um, the Center for Professional Development now to implement some of those activities, um, including um, uh, our SUNY Learning Commons, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Do you want to talk about ePub or do you want me to? Go for it. Okay, our ePublishing task group is similar to uh, what we're hearing more and more, e-textbooks. It actually started out of uh, a legislator that had interest in that. The provost came to us and said, we need to do some research along the, these lines, and uh, we need to look at open education resources. A group of very, very interesting librarians, energetic librarians, came together and said, we're on it. And they were the most prolific task group going for quite some time, just a lot of, of trading of resources. and. 
They've hosted a couple of workshops and they have migrated very successfully into the uh, into a community of practice in our SUNY Learning Commons as well. The Intellectual Property Task Group, our chancellor is serious about taking a look at online instruction, uh, putting the SUNY Learning Network on steroids, and one of the concerns that faculty have goes to the issue of copyright. We heard a lot about that yesterday morning as well. So this group was really about looking at what are the policies within SUNY, what's unique to our particular institution. We have uh, a UUP contract that we went back and, and took a look at and basically went to the provost and, and said if, if this is where we're going institutionally, it would be good to have clarity on these issues uh, so our faculty feel comfortable moving ahead with these initiatives. And uh, we were very pleased that the provost supported those is issues that effort wholeheartedly and made it the focus of many of his comments at the last CIT conference. I think one of the things that uh, we've been really most excited about uh, is to find that, um, that our, our provost is really uh, carrying forward that message uh, throughout his own, his own uh, dialogue within the system. It's, it's, it's really impressive to see that, how that's turning out. So, uh, so those were the first four task groups um, that we had, and as you saw from each one of those, there were some really very tangible deliverables that have resulted in some action at the system level, and um, where we are, ba based on the success of that experiment, because it really was a bit of an experiment, um, we have uh, formed some new task groups, uh, learning analytics, looking at e-portfolios and our strategy for the system, and then developmental um, courseware. So those three task groups have just been charged and are getting started in that annual cycle which we outlined um, for the year, and we'll be reporting on their outcomes um, at our conference next May. Yeah, I'd just like to comment, uh, if you could take something away from this, is these are, all these task groups are very specific, they're clearly defined, they run for one cycle, and then they go away. So it's not like something that just stays up and lives forever, right. and the membership becomes stagnant. I mean, we want to get the deliverable, get it to the provost, and then move on to the next big thing. And the membership of the task groups comes from the campuses. This is not the council doing this work. It's really people out on the campuses who are doing the work and reporting to the council and to the provost. So it's really a way of engaging people across the system in a way that really hasn't been done in a long time. So um, it, it's, it's been very, um, I think, empowering for a lot of our um, campus folks as well. I think, I think we bounced over that in the, one of the first couple of slides because we were actually tying it back to the, the conversation we had with the president from UNLV yesterday who stressed, you know, everyone is doing more with less and there's less resources and more demands for productivity. And it's difficult for a campus to say to someone, yes, we will endorse your participation in this task group or your participation in a broader SUNY-wide effort when all the campuses are struggling with their own deliverables at their own, at their own regional level or their own campus level. So it w we really needed to work to define the return on investment that if you give of your time, you will get some clear tangibles back in the, in the form of reports, in the form of knowing what's going on in terms of other initiatives that are being launched through SUNY. It's, and it's been a pretty successful sell. Yeah. So um, another aspect of innovative instruction um, that, you know, this came out um, of the initial report of this transformation team was the formation of a SUNY Learning Commons, which uh, is um, a virtual platform to enable communication and collaboration across the system. This, you know, has not existed in SUNY and communication is one of our biggest challenges because we are so large and geographically dispersed. And so um, we envisioned this concept of a virtual platform which could be the place to go in SUNY um, for faculty, staff, and students to access learning opportunities and information and thinking about that in the broadest sense of the word. And where that ties into this initiative is that one of the first pieces of the SUNY Learning Commons that we're implementing is to support communities of practice across SUNY. And these task groups 
um, you know, very much are functioning as communities of practice, sharing information, um, communicating regularly uh, with each other, um, uh, collaborating on documents and resources and um, doing studies, collecting best practices, sharing them. So the, the SUNY Learning Commons, and you, you know, you can um, go to it there, um, see the URL. Um, there's a, there's um, you know, a small public piece of it right now, a lot of it is, is behind password, but um, you know, we are really looking at this to help us um, not just promote um, innovation, but to be able to capture and share all of the innovative things that are happening in the system. And so there's, um, we're just at the tip of the iceberg with this, and there's much more to come, but we think it's gonna be a really important piece of the, of the picture for innovative instruction. And then um, the third piece on the slide that we want to talk about are that we have some, um, we have a new program called the SUNY Innovative Instruction Technology Grants Program. And um, this really, tying this back to um, that slide that Lisa showed that had, had the innovation grants, as part of our annual cycle, we always had um, a small pot of money that was available to support um, campus-based initiatives to promote um, innovation and use of um, technology in education. In support of this whole innovative instruction initiatives, the provost really got behind this and said, we really need to do much more in this area. And we repurposed um, a significant pot of money at SUNY to provide almost a million dollars worth of um, competitive grant money to campuses. So campuses can apply for grant money to um, uh, develop or um, uh, um, explore innovation in some way on their campus, across multiple campuses, and um, uh, this is the first year of that grant program, and we were overwhelmed with proposals, um, very positive response, and um, we'll have the outcomes of these grants reported on at our conference in May, um, and we're already getting ready for the next cycle of grants. And Lisa um, has been spearheading that in her role working with us now at System Administration. So that's been a big, huge win and success that really has some teeth behind it, significant amount of money that is going out directly to the campuses to pursue innovative instruction. And, and one of the focus really is is scalability. That, yeah. I mean that's not really a requirement, but you know you want to be able you want to fund people who can figure out how to do something yep. on their campus and then lend that expertise to anyone else who's interested. And and, and we're seeing a lot of um, projects where people are saying, here's something that we've been doing on this scale that really could be replicated by other campuses or system wide, and that's really what we're going for. So, um, so it's very exciting, and you know, stay tuned because I'm sure we'll have lots more to report on that. And and. And I'd be happy to address more about that grants program in the Q&A part if you'd like to hear more. But the brief of it is that we have funding tiers, depending on the project that people want to execute as sort of um, high risk, high reward projects. But there will also be a second round of funding that will be a considerably larger pot of money for those that can, those projects that prove to be applicable at a production level, such as a multi-campus uh, initiative right now to explore gaming and development of apps and things mm -hmm. of that nature. So a lot going on in that area. Mm -hmm. Ah, lessons learned. Um, yeah, I guess the, one of the things that we, we decided was ultimately important is the sustainability of the program. Uh, and in conjunction with that, uh, I mean, we want it to survive all of us. We're just players getting the ball rolling. Um, but uh, so to do that, we've uh, been revisiting the bylaws uh, to define clear roles and responsibilities and opportunities um, because what we found is in years past, and I'm fairly new to the group, but. Uh, uh, there have been um, members who have lived on the council for very long and created almost dynasties. Well, that's not a good uh, formula for innovation. Uh, we want to get people in and get them excited, get them involved, have them use their energies, and then uh, get other people involved. So, uh, you know, we're, we're working on the, on the uh, bylaws for that. And then um, part of that sustainability is assessment and really looking at you know, on each cycle, how things are working and um, putting in place processes to allow us to continuously improve. So in that annual cycle, um, particularly for these task groups, they have um, different points in time whereby they're reporting to the council and getting feedback, where they're reporting to the provost and getting feedback, and uh, 
and that happens throughout the cycle so that by the time we get to the outcome, what is delivered is very close to what was originally intended. And each cycle, we look at this and say, okay, how did that work? And is there more that we need to do to support the task groups? Is there more that we need to do to um, engage other stakeholders? Is there more that, that we can do to um, facilitate the work of these groups? That's where like the learning commons came into play. So we're, we have that built into our cycle as well. And one of the roles of uh, my organization is to provide staff support to the council um, and to work with these groups to provide some of the tools and the technologies for collaboration and communication and so so that's a constant thing that we're looking at and um, and you know as Brad was alluding to um, helps the sustainability but with an emphasis on continuous improvement so the return on investment um, it's it's making sure that people find value again in their participation in any of these initiatives, uh, making sure that their campus leadership is behind them to participate in any of those initiatives, um, and making sure that there's good incentive on the table. Now, obviously, with the grant money now on the table, there's a much nicer incentive for all of the campuses to get energized and to, to work nicely together. Although we, we are finding a couple of things that are surprising. I, I didn't really see some of the challenges of getting IRB approval to do multi-campus projects. Uh, that, that was interesting. Uh, there's been some challenges in terms of purchasing, you know, when you're purchasing equipment and resources across multiple campuses. So we're learning a lot on this initial phase, but we're making sure there's good return on investment all the way around. I, I think the structure and processes that, that have been that have been put in place over the last couple of years in the in the reinvention of, of the of the fact council has really helped with uh, the consistency of the message that goes out to all the stakeholders. So as, as we as we mentioned earlier, you know the consistency of that message to the to the system provost has allowed him to kind of absorb that into his dialogue with the chief academic officers and the presidents and all of the folks that he deals with on a regular basis. And then of course, as that message gets out to the campus reps and through the conference and, and all of the other channels that gets out, you know, people are always asking, well, what's the priority? What are, what are we really should, what should we really be focusing on? What are the things that are most important for us to do first, second, third? And, and having that kind of consistency of message, I think gives people some confidence that there's some solid, credible work behind this advice. And, and when they hear that replicated by the SUNY provost, and then maybe even by their own provost, uh, you know, that consistency of message provides some real strength uh, in, in executing on some of these innovations. It was an incredible privilege to serve as the chair of this organization for a couple of years, and I've actually participated in it, participated in it for a number of years. Um, and I think that the, the biggest takeaway for me in terms of organizing things was recognizing opportunity when it was there. It was an incredible intersection that Kim was coming on board right at the same time that we were getting a dynamic chancellor and a provost that was willing to listen to us. So then it just became uh, an opportunity of playing to people's strengths and saying, geez, I know so-and-so on the group has a good background on library issues and, and is really interested in open education resources. And then finding a way to work with that person to make it possible for them to lead an initiative. It's all about identifying the right people and then trying the, as best you can to remove whatever roadblocks you can and also accepting when you can't remove some of those roadblocks and figuring out ways you know, to do some workarounds. Um, so playing to people's strengths is what has given the whole organization incredible energy and we're so lucky that the person that succeeded the chair of the organization is a SUNY distinguished teaching professor who's very, very active in the faculty senate who immediately said we need to take this to the next level and, and capitalize on the intersection with our university-wide faculty senate, get involved with some of the SUNY distinguished uh, professors, get some of their expertise involved. So I think that we're really working on that sustainability issue and I, I 
think that uh, I think we're going to be around for a little while longer. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that will really help that, as as Brad had mentioned earlier, uh, you know, for a number of years on this council, there had been a tendency for there to be to. to it was very uh, dependent on, on a small group of very strong uh, technologists and leaders and, 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 and great thinkers, but that, that's not truly sustainable. And, and what we really tried to do was capitalize on, on the, uh, trying to infect people with enthusiasm. And, and so by identifying, uh, by not trying to keep all of the work and the effort within the council, really going, reaching out to the campuses, identifying those champions who were really gung-ho about a given initiative or a given uh, project and saying, let's bring them into the loop, let's, let's have them lead us, in, and then let's get out of their way <laughs> and, and provide them the support that they need to run with that ball as far as they can. And, uh, the, and, and that enthusiasm will likely in turn infect others uh, who, who have a similar kind of uh, uh, thinking and priority and value system that, that we, we know is out there in the field, but we, we have, have uh, just begun to figure out how to harness. Um, we wanted to put, uh, we wanted to save time for any interaction or, you know, to go get a cup of coffee, whatever you'd like. <laughs> um, but uh, that pretty much concludes our formal presentation, but we'd like to hear more about what's going on on your campuses or your systems and how some of this may scale, you know, in your circumstance. Or if you have any questions for us. Or for Marty. <laughs> <laughs> Could be Starbucks time. Could be. Could be. So. Does this re resonate with anybody? Anybody have similar activities going on on your campuses? Yeah. No. Can you just wait till he gets the microphone? You betcha. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't appear to be on. Test. There we go. <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay, so um, we have a lot of things that happen like in a yearly cycle as well. You've got end of year funds that, that come and get dispersed or have to be spent by a certain time. And of course, we've got cutoffs that say, listen, if you don't get it in by now, it's not going to happen. Um, also, you know, proposals for uh, what we call HETEP, which is higher ed, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, several different things like that that'd be helpful. And so it'd be kind of nice for our department to get involved in this type of a thing. Um, so I see a lot of merit in doing this. Uh, it also seems like a whole lot of work. And so when I go back with a great idea that's a whole lot of work for someone that's not me, <laughs> yeah, I have trouble selling that. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of neat to see that y'all have something going and I could point to the validness of this mm -hmm. and hopefully be able to get other um, one of the problems we have is our department. We have great ideas because we do. It's our department. It's us. They're our ideas. We think they're great. And we want to keep them out there um, versus people like going out and then just, you know, ordering whatever in the world they find in a magazine that they saw on a plane. You just, I saw the pain in your eyes there, sir. Um, so, you know, you, you know what I'm getting at. Like, this is yeah. the la latest shiny thing. We have a good version of it that we've already recommended, but no one knows because they can order their own stuff and right. do. Right. So this type of thing I think would be just kind of cool. And I've already yeah. sent an email out to those who would be in charge of that. Mm. So kind of cool. So I, I, I just like to comment. Um, I'm, I'm fairly new to the group, and it, it was just so it was so refreshing. It was an eye opener. I mean, I live in the trenches. I have these great ideas myself on occasion, <laughs> but to hear the vice chancellor provost of the SUNY system say these are the things that are important to the system, to him, I mean, that was, it, it's, it, it's very invigorating. And, yeah. and it clarifies what really people like myself should be working on. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it also helps from a leadership perspective because it's so easy to get into the weeds and, and to be able to map back to the priorities, institutional priorities and say, yeah, there's a lot of latitude here, but let's make sure that we're staying on path with, with the bigger plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thank you. 
Anybody else? Anything similar happening or? Well, as they say in Vegas, we'll be here all week. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.